And as we speak, I'm letting my colleagues in here from the, uh, from the meeting room. Um, I would like to welcome first and foremost, um, and a big thank you, first of all, to a lady called Helen, um, who worked so hard to put all of these shows together for us. Um, can I ask everybody just to mute, uh, to mute their phones if it's possible? So Helen has been putting a lot of hard work in, in promoting um, tr tourism, not only in Namibia, but our neighboring countries. And she's doing this um, for the love of horses and her love of wild horses. So Helen, first of all, I want to say thank you very much because you are a big part of the show. Um, behind the scenes also, um, I've got a wonderful team that always supports us, um, which is Chris from Cape Town, which is our creative director. Hi, Chris. We've got Joseph Kafunda, who's part of us there in Evolfus Bay this evening. Uh, we've got behind the scenes, I know they are hiding their faces, is Marilee Safontaine and Sophia um, Claster. She's recently got married, so her name has changed. And then, of course, my co-host, who I always uh, rope in, who is just Andrew Gillis. Mm -hmm. So, welcome. <laughs> thank you so much for joining and thank you for all your hard work. Um, this show is really to, um, you know, to give back to tourism, to help maybe as soon as the gates open, to, to keep it alive and to, um, to promote tourism, as I said, in Namibia and our neighboring countries. And on this show, we speak to the most amazing people and which you're gonna meet three of them this evening. Um, and we have been speaking, so keep watching. We've got, we try to keep it as often as possible on a weekly basis. And we thank you all for joining us live also on Facebook. So the amazing people that I'm gonna introduce you tonight is Mandy and Pat. Uh, Reds Club, they've got uh, horsing safaris there in Mozambique, and they've got a very interesting story to tell. A hearty welcome to you guys, a Namibian welcome, I should say. <laughs> so welcome to you guys. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. And Mitchell. then we've got a beautiful, young, and talented photographer, uh, Tegan Cunliffe. And <laughs> Tegan, you also, you're a photographer and you're also a journalist. Is that correct? Yes. A yes, travel journalist. Yes. Okay. Well, lovely to have you guys on the show. So, CNN Inside Africa has documented two horse related stories, both about where people step in to ensure the horse's survival. These are two very different stories, yet it's hard not to have been for human intervention, how different both stories would have been for the horses and perhaps too for those who stepped in to save them. So Helen, could you please um, um, just share the, your presentation with us? So I don't know how many people have seen this. Um, I really would recommend we'll share the links afterwards um, of the CNN cover. Um, coverage of these two shows. Oh, there we go. We've got the Inside Africa. Uh, Pat and Mandy, is this your view? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. Is this where you're wow. currently at at the moment? No. No, no. We're, no, okay. we're definitely not there. That's where okay. Tegan said. Um, it is a private villa. Um, oh. And we're at Sonia's, where our guests We're stay. right next door to that. Wow, that is amazing. So you can actually go to those, to the, are you close to the beach from where you live? On the we're beach. On the beach. Oh, we are so envious. I mean, yeah. we swam in that in January. It was so warm. It oh. really was so beautiful. Well, our deep bond with horses often yeah, takes yeah. us on a journey in which mm -hmm. momental change happens. In both cases, the turmoil of politics or war played a role. When lives fall apart, yet they are kept together by the incredible bonds formed by remarkable horses. When your life is thrown into turmoil, do you just give up or do you ride the wave no matter what or where it takes you? Mandy, you and Pat found yourselves in the grip of a moving wave, which had you not kept up. Well, tell us what happened in 2001. Well, um, the land invasion started in 2001, um, but just before that was the killing of Dave Stevens, um, a farm, and I don't think anybody was really prepared for what took place. Um, you know, African politics, uh, Mugabe uh, had an opposition, and um, I think that he held a referendum to change the constitution, and everybody voted against it, and I think the impact of that is when it um, all started. So, 
it, it, it set it off. And uh, we were uh, the first 45 farms trashed and looted. And our neighbors, the Kelden Hases, um, they were barricaded in their house with their two small children. Um, it was absolutely terrible, but um, they managed to, you know, get out of that situation and get back to South Africa. But they had a lot of horses. We only had six horses on our, our farm. And uh, that was the start. We um, took uh, some of uh, Shah's horses and that's the start of us taking horses in. Mandy, uh, did this happen in, this happened in Zimbabwe, correct? That's yes. right, yes, yes. And then you and, and then you moved over to uh, to Mozambique. I'm sure it was not an easy track. Well, we had six evictions in the end, um, and we had had it gathered a lot of horses. Now I must say, Patrick is really the one who saved all these horses, and I couldn't say no. But I I, I must say that I, there were moments when I thought he'd lost his mind, but. Uh, we ended up, our, our, you know, to cut a long story short, we ended up in the town of Matari, which was on the Mozambique border. And I'd, I'd had about 250 horses roaming around. And unfortunately, we'd had a very peaceful uh, two years there. But sadly, what happened was the land invasions then sort of got there. And overnight, it, the, the grazing had gone. And we eventually ended up with a lot of the horses just rounded up at a school and that's when we realized that we we really needed to do something and that was when the idea of crossing the border into how long, how long did this journey take you i mean to move from zimbabwe to mozambique all in all uh, four years i think yeah, three or four years we we started we we sent well what happened just to tell you you know obviously farmers um, we ended up um doing agronomy for a company and a lot of people were very interested in Mozambique. It had just come out of a civil war. And a lot of Zimbabwean companies, especially the tobacco, you know, agriculture companies, were looking at it as a place where they could get a new sort of, um, you know, client base. And everybody was pretty excited about Mozambique. But let me tell you, let me tell you, facing the war vets was one thing. But Mozambique after civil war, well, that was something that Pat and I uh, really... Um, sure. We didn't know what to expect. It was, it was a really new experience. Yeah. But they always say, you know, follow your dreams. And when you do so, you, you know, you'll, be, you'll make a lot of money and you'll be happy with your work. So I think you had bigger dreams than just that. So your dreams were obviously um, to, be, to um, do horse riding safaris in Mozambique. So now you run Mozambique horse safaris in, in Vilanculos and even mm. have your horses on the Benguera Island. Um, yeah. Do you still have some of the original 104 horses in your string? We have 18 left. 18 of the original 104. That's not all the ones alive. There are others alive, but those are the ones we've got. Sure. Yeah. And what, how, how, how did it happen? How did you lose these horses? Was it obviously, is it a different area? Well, it's to... it's uh, nearly, no, no. Well, it's uh, quite some time. So we've had... Uh, a lot die of <laughs> old age, obviously. Yeah. And uh, then we had poisoning. In 2010. We lost 30 in one shot, which yeah. was a felt poisoning. Which, and, uh, um, and then some... It was a big knock to us. Yeah, and some terrible things sort of happened in Mozambique as well uh, with horses, you know, sort of fencing stolen and, and losing horses, you know. Yeah, we lost, uh, with fencing stolen, we lost about five or six being run over on the, on the highway. Sure. But, uh, generally, they did very well. Mozambique, where we are here, yeah. is actually um, pretty, uh, uh, the horses love it. The environment's great. It's very dry. Um, they do very well here. The grass is good. Sure. Did this, please, can we go back one photo there, Helen? Um, to tell us about this. I mean, this is just crazy. This horse is on a boat. So <laughs> tell us your journey. <laughs> that's, uh, you've been to Benguera. That's a horse being, that's me in the water. And that's uh, Mushy. His name's Mushy. 
I, I hope there's no one German on there. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, <laughs> jumping off the back of the boat into the water. It's a wonderful photo of that, yeah. but they all had to jump off. We had uh, six, I think, on that boat. Six. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, going back to Michelle, going back to that's a lovely Zimbabwean um, expression. You know, it means Mushy great, means fantastic. Nice. But on okay. German side, Tell us that it's uh, not a good Something name. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I love this. We can make fun of each other. You see, Andrew, you should step in here. <laughs> but listen, uh, just another question. I mean, how on earth did you move so many horses? How did you get it across the border? Uh, did you load them with trucks? Did you sneak them across the border? Because I would totally think about sneaking them across. <laughs> no, you, no, we, you we couldn't tried do that. to. We did uh, try. We, we no, tried well, we it. looked at it. And uh, in fact, the problem was uh, Mozambique more than Zimbabwe because they're so full of uh, um, bureaucracy. Uh, we would have had the problem in Mozambique. But anyway, no, uh, the... we took them over all legally. Uh, but it took us three years. And the problem was Zimbabwe, not Mozambique at all. No, but the army and the, were up uh, Zimbabwe just didn't want any agricultural products or anything like that to go through. So we struggled. It certainly gave me grey hairs. Like I said, it took about three years. But we eventually got 104 over. Sure, I'm sure you got more than just grey hairs. <laughs> well done on that. That is a truly amazing story. Um, and now we've got um, our beautiful photographer, Tegan. Tell us, you, you've been to Mozambique. Uh, you went to Mozambique as a photographer. Um, oh, have you been to Mozambique as a photographer? Is the, are these your photos? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I just got confused for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a few times before, but I'd always wanted to photograph at the Mozambique horse safari, especially after I heard... Pat and Mandy's a remarkable story. Okay. So when Paul Redscliffe, Mandy and Pat's son gave me the opportunity, I just jumped at it. I mean, alongside deserts, oceans and waters are just one of my favorite places to photograph. And put, if you put horses into the mix, I mean, you just can't beat it. So uh, Pat and Mandy were so helpful and they put me onto Benguera Island, which is where I met Charlotte um, in the bottom right photo that you can see there. And Charlotte is there, a long-standing crew member, um, and she runs the Benguera side of the operation. And uh, she showed me around. Benguera is beautiful. Um, it's just clear blue waters and sandy beaches, exactly like a tropical island. Um, and yeah, the goal of this whole exercise was just to try and capture photographs that really just showed how beautiful this place is and tried to encourage as many people to visit as I possibly could. And I really hope that they achieved that. Because we tried very hard over the <laughs> <about> 10 days, <laughs> stress along the way. Um, but yeah, uh, it was a great experience, a really great experience. There, these are some phenomenal photos. Um, Helen, could we go a few shots back? There's one I specifically want to ask you where the horse is, uh, I think it's the very first one, um, where the horse is in the water. And then tell us how you took the one more back, please. I just want to see, and we've got some comments from everybody coming through saying how amazing it is. Uh, yeah, one drone. more back, Helen, please. I just want to ask you, because I mean, I'm not a photographer and I, I really want to do this because we went horse riding as well. Um, not horse riding as such for, for an hour or so in Mozambique in January, myself and Chris. And, um, and we... We took a new camera and I'm going tell you, I could not take any photos like this. Helen, can we do one more back? I just want some tips on how Tegan at these photos. There uh, we go. It's the one that's in the water. Doesn't matter. Tell us, how do you, did you take that photo that was uh, the horses halfway in the water? In the water? So I think it's this one that you're talking about. Um, that was done by drone. Uh, and obviously like islands and drone from the sky. I mean, you've seen the Bazaruta archipelago and it's just shades of blue and white sands and it's just it's best viewed from above 
So I knew I had to take my drone along when I was photographing these horses. Okay, so it's drone, and then there's half the water. The other photos is where the horse is halfway in the water. Ah, um, that you, okay. you can see underwater and on top of the What is that? Can't be the drone. That must be something yeah, else. No, <laughs> Did you put your camera in a plastic bag or like. <laughs> no. No, man. She did not want to hear that. <laughs> no, I was taken with a GoPro and a GoPro housing. So, along with you know taking photographs of horses in this new place, I also used it as a chance to experiment with different equipment. And one of them was a GoPro with housing. I think it's way back, Helen, it's one of the yeah. first few sources. Um, but yeah, it was one of those trial and error type shots where you, you don't really know what you're taking photographs of and you just kind of hope that the horses are in frame and that you can see something yeah. at the end of the day. You only really know when you get home and download the photos. <laughs> It's really, this is, these are such beautiful photos. I mean, and you can't describe it because I know for myself, the beauty that you see through the, your lens right now is actually what it looks like. I mean, you've captured it perfectly. It's really, I can see with eyes, yeah. And we've got some comments of people saying how much they love this one as well. If you um, go back one photo, if you don't mind, um, you'll see that's Pat there and- Oh. Um, they really pulled out all the stops just to try and, and get me what I needed. And I really wanted to get an aspect of the local traditional life because <coughs> it's such an interesting country, but it's also a really hard country to live in from both the local perspective and people trying to make a sort of business sustainably there. And these horses alongside the Dows and this whole interaction that you have with horse safaris and local living, and it's just so natural. It's, it's a phenomenal place to, to see and ride at. Yeah. This is really, congratulations on these photos. They are really, really lovely. <laughs> uh, we're going to give some information afterwards uh, where you can purchase uh, some of uh, Tegan's work and we're going to also give you some uh, website information and Facebook and social media. So don't, don't go too far. Um, this is really stunning. Um, Pat and Mandy, um, this, I think this is, this is uh, the place where your guests stay when they come on your... Um, yeah. on your tours, is that correct? Yes, Sonia's Lodge. That's the house we're sitting in now. Oh, I feel so sorry for you. I'm really, really <laughs> <laughs> terribly sorry. <laughs> uh, how, many, how many guests can you take in that place? We, well, it depends. We, we don't like more than eight on a safari. So, but we, we tend to get, you know, twos, threes, um, fours usually we, we don't have very big groups okay and is that you don't have scheduled tours there these are booked as groups individual groups or do you have scheduled packages as well no, we don't we don't we we have day rides that's our main business is day rides so we support like on the island Benguera island there's uh, lodges on the island so we do day rides similar to what you did at uh, at when you were in Madrid. Okay, all right. I don't think I'd last a day though. <laughs> but no, no, that no. is good to I know. Day, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, an hour and a half. Okay. Yeah, what you did, yeah. So, but that is good for you guys because it means you're probably um, one of the few that has um, inland activities. I mean, I would imagine that anything else in Mozambique is like on the water. That's, uh, you, you're yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. They've started things like. Uh, uh, four wheelers now and stuff, but yeah, the horses are fantastic, and we're obviously very business when uh, very busy when there's bad conditions mm. for driving and things like that. So it's fantastic for the guests. Yeah, really, that is definitely a must for everybody. I can definitely recommend it. Um, so now I want to go back to you, Tegan. Um, you have got um, a love and a passion uh, for our Namibian wild horses, as same as all of us. And um, tell me a little bit more about the wild horses um, and your love for them. Well, I first heard about the wild horses when I was quite young. Um, coming from South Africa, I'd heard about people going through to Namibia and visiting them from a sort of tourist perspective. And I never really thought that I would get the chance to actually go and photograph them, let alone work with them so intimately over the past few years. And it actually happened quite organically. Um, I was on a horse safari with Nobia Horse Safari Company. And 
one of, one of the well, the established, very famous guys is uh, Dr. Talani Grayling, who also does the research on the wild horses in Namibia. And she told me about these horses, and I just had to, I had to go and have a look. How did you so, meet Talani? So she was one of the guys on the trail. Um, okay. She, yeah, this was my first time in Namibia, and my mind was blown. Um, I had taken a break from work and from our previous job, and to go into a place with fast skies and just free loose horses and desert camping at night, uh, I was just consecutively happy for just days and end. And that's where I met Andrew in the bottom right. <laughs> Um, also a very, very famous face. <laughs> <laughs> My co-host, Andrew, tell us a little bit about this tour. And I must say, listen, these photos are just as beautiful as the ones from Mozambique, really. Easy subject material. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, tell us a little bit about this trip. Well, that's um, around the Koichab area, big dunes, as Tegan says, loose horses, vast skies, fast riding. Um, it was very easy to he to 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 host Tegan. Um, <laughs> very very talented, <laughs> as you can see by all these pictures of him. Yeah, and we basically started in in vulva dance and ended up at the wild horses, and that's where Tilani, I guess, ignited the, the passion <laughs> with Tegan. Yeah. To uh, our last our last sundowners are spent standing around, and all the, the wild horses come and stand around, essentially. They're quite like that, that picture on the left over there. As you can okay. see, they're not that wild anymore. They're quite interested. I'm very impressed at how clean that car is. I'm just looking at that. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, so that's, I guess, Stay for the show. Tegan, Tegan and Talani got together. Yeah, yeah, there you go. The car was clean that day. Yeah. <laughs> how long was this trip, Andrew? they eight days. They're all 10 days safaris. It's, it's eight days camping through the desert. Okay. Um, camping, camping wild, sleeping under the stars. So the whole crew goes along. It's like the circus. We've got the kitchen trailer. We've got a very clever chef called Rain, which is ironic in the desert. And um, ice for gin and tonic, hot showers, enough mm. enough whiskey to numb the pain. And uh, yeah, that is that it's, is it's really a, great. But the, so did you give Tegan enough time? Did you, Tegan, did you wander off on your own and then go take photos? Or did you go, was this a specifically a, phot a photographic tour? Was it specifically for Tegan? No. Was it the other people and you just did your own thing no, and joined so, up later? No, so this was part of the trail. So at the end of the trail, on the last day, you go and visit the horses. And that's when um, Talani, she had on the trail told us about the plight of the horses. Um, at that stage, they'd had a severe drought for about five years where not enough rain had happened and there was just no grass. And in addition to that, there was hyena predation, which it's normal, but it was being done to severe, severe lengths. And um, I think they had something like, stand to be corrected, but like 100 horses taken in the space of a year or so. Um, and that was the part of it that really got me because the foundation, on the ground there being Christina and Talani were putting so much of their time and effort and like physical body into feeding these horses and keeping them alive during this dark drought. And I just wanted to spread that story. It was, it was something I wanted people to know about. So after that, that's when Talani and I started photographing these horses. Um, the foundation and Manny Goldberg brought me on to document what was at the time what they thought the last crop of foals. So they thought the generation of wild horses was going to die out and they wanted to have footage of these foals on hand. And it was, it was a sad assignment. Um, it is quite sad sort of being out there and documenting these horses that may or may not be around the next day. And you have to, you have to really distance yourself from your subject material because as cute as they are, they come up to you and they nibble your shoes. And it's just amazing being out there in this natural landscape where the horses are just doing what they want. Um, they're completely at ease. And yeah, it was something oh. that I wanted to, as best as I could, try and show what it is like for these horses living out there in an untouched condition. They've been there for about a hundred years. They've formed the Nama breed. They're hardy, they're tough, they're resilient, but through really no fault of their own, they're kind of dying out now. So yeah, it was a privilege. 
to be there. What a, what a cute, beautiful photo we're looking <laughs> at right now. And I can see Pat and Mandy also. I can see them doing their oohs and their ahs there on the couch. And I can just imagine that you probably takes you back to the memories of your days when you had to also save all these horses, you know, and that I think that's what's bringing us all together yeah, today, you know, um, and also in the time that we're going through such difficult times now, you know. Um, so what better way to do this through horses? Um, this is stunning. I have to tell you, Tegan, I've got a little bit of inside information about how far you walk to get to these horses, carrying heavy bags, yeah. uh, but taking phenomenal photos. I mean, and then the horses would run away and so on. Is it true? Because I believe you were tracking them. And, yeah, oh. so, amazing photos. So yeah. tell us how easy it is to get to these horses, but tell the truth, because I already know. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they're close and sometimes they are far and you've got to yeah. walk and walk. And sometimes the weather's perfect and sometimes the east wind is howling. So conditions are extreme out there. Um, you have beautiful mornings where the dawn light is soft and the horses are standing around and everything is so calm. And then you have days which are just dramatic with howling winds and the horses are leaning into the winds and they're just looking very sad to be out there alone. <laughs> But yeah, it, it takes a lot of legwork. Um, it is much easier when, when Salani's with me because she knows where the horses are going to be and she knows their behavior. So quite often, even though I know a bit about horses, you can't really predict what they're going to do and when they're going to do it. And there's a herd around you. So you'll be focusing on one area, but a horse will do something behind you. And then that's where having Salani on hand is absolutely like such an advantage because she'll be watching their behavior the whole time and say watch that bachelor over there he's going to do something shortly and i'll just train my camera and wait so <laughs> wow so it depends. yeah you have to listen to her she did a phd didn't she on yeah. these wild horses so she knows what she's talking about yeah, she knows exactly yeah. she studied them for so many years i think from the early 90s and mm. um I mean, she goes around and, and collects teeth records and she, she knows each generation and she knows their different behavioral patterns. And it's just remarkable to be witness to the stories out there in the desert. I think that's probably the, the next best thing to being alone in these wild, sort of vast landscapes is to be with her when she talks to you just about the things that you're yeah, saying. Yeah. Well, um, I, th I think uh, Helen uh, and Andrew, a uh, note to you guys, maybe we need to get her on board next time because we want to ask her some questions. I know she's a little bit shy. <laughs> I see you laughing, Tegan. This is one amazing shot. This is so beautiful. Tell me about this picture. Wow. So this happens very quickly. Uh, the horses can be grazing. They can graze for hours and then all of a sudden something will happen. And uh, I'm filming at the same time as photographing. So you have to switch between quite quickly and decide whether you want to video or photograph. But with this particular photograph, um, yeah, I think I managed to get it just in time before I switched off my video. And I think you can see the text underneath the bottom. We are doing a print drive in support of the foundation. Um, at the moment, they're going through another period of droughts. They're doing feeding programs, which they only do when they really have to. They try and keep these horses as untouched as possible, but when it's necessary to step in and help, they are on the ground doing it. And they're doing it with nobody even knowing. It's this background process of complete effort and just life dedication that's going on. And yeah, I think that's the real remarkable thing about these stories is that the people behind them put in so much of their life and their effort and their dedication and their motivation. And we really, the horses would not be around if not for them. And I don't know if this will play, but it's a very cute oh. little, oh, it's playing. <laughs> oh, that is so cute. It's just, yeah, it's so special to be out there. You know, the movie is special. But sure. Andrew, we want to see all of this when we go on your tours. <laughs> Just going to do the wild horses trip. We'll show you. <laughs> oh, that is so beautiful. Um, so I wanted to ask you a question. It's completely slipped my mind because I was looking at this. Uh, these horses are so great. Uh, to, just tell me, um, you are you're doing some drawings and you are donating some of the funds to the Wild Horse Foundation. Tell us a little bit more about that. Okay, so that's actually somebody else. I think it's Giselle. Oh, is it, oh sorry, sorry. Okay. She's very good at what she does. Her okay. drawings are so realistic. It's mm -hmm. actually 
she she puts Sorry. everything body to shame <laughs> completely. <laughs> <laughs> And she did a um, an arts raffle a few weeks ago, which oh, just okay. raised so much money and supported foundation. So yeah, she's been an absolute addition to what this foundation are doing. And if we want to purchase some of your of your photos and pictures, are we able to do so? Is it for sale to the public? Of course, yes. Um, so you can either go through the Wild Horse Foundation website, or you can go through my website, which is also listed over here. And like I said, any 50% of the proceeds go directly towards supporting horses, keeping the feeding programs going and keeping research efforts going. Sorry, I got confused now between all you remarkable ladies, <laughs> <laughs> drawings <laughs> of photographers. <laughs> Mandy, you wrote a book. Um, tell us about your book and where can we buy your book? <laughs> Um, well, I'm very bad about promoting the book really in, in Bill and Kulo, but um, uh, it, you can buy it in South Africa. Exclusive books um, usually have it at the airport, so you can buy it there. Um, Amazon, you can buy it on Amazon. And um, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, you, yeah, order it on Amazon, I think. That's probably the easiest. <laughs> or exclusive book. Well, it's going to be easy I, now with lockdown. Everybody's online ordering, so we'll definitely keep an eye on it, out for it. Um, you can get it on Kindle, and I have seen it on Google where they say download free 104 horses. So maybe if you Google, uh -huh. you probably get it more. <laughs> uh, Michelle, before we, we uh, lock off, I just want to, to ask Bat and Mandy, uh, you started. You said you started with six horses, uh, and then you amassed more horses, taking in neighbors' horses, etc. Before you moved, how many horses did you have uh, before you moved to Mozambique? Uh, well, we had a lot, quite a lot. So, Pat, um, when we decided, what we saved was a drop in the ocean. So we started. My idea at the beginning was to. Uh, save horses and everything was going to come right the eternal optimist and we could then give them back because these were horses that had got used to the uh, the the uh, environment there they'd been there years and years can I uh, just butt in here Honestly, <laughs> please do <laughs> that, that thought that they would never destroy over a hundred years of agriculture We'd sit at a dinner table, but you know why everybody discussed the politics and Pat said they would never destroy agriculture. And about 20 people would disagree with him. And that's exactly what happened. He amassed the horses, thought we'd all go back to a normal life and it just didn't turn out that way. So yeah, we, we ended up with a, with a lot <laughs> and uh, we then got a name for, for taking in horses. So then we weren't getting just the next door neighbors. We were getting from other areas. What and was that, that name? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I was going to ask I would say, thing. Pat, you are not taking another horse. <laughs> but, um, yeah. And we had a lovely girl called Gadia um, who was working with Pat. And Gadia also had that a heart of God. So between the two of them, I was, you know, taken out of the picture. Because all I worried about was how are we going to look after all these horses? But anyway, Pat did it. She did it. <laughs> With so the okay, sorry, Chris. Harness. Everybody's and asking questions now quickly at the same time. Sorry, sorry. Andrew, did you want to ask something? You mean? Oh, no, Andrew. Okay, sorry. Please go ahead. Um, I just want to know, you've also got a volunteering program happening yeah. there in Mozambique at the moment. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, we have lovely people that um, come out and uh, it's more of a working holiday. So they actually pay to come out, but um, we have the loveliest people. We really do. Our, our volunteer program has been one of the best things that's ever happened to us. We meet absolutely lovely girls and they're so supportive. And I must just tell you, through this crisis, um, you know, that we've experienced here, I mean, we've had a lot of support from our ex-volunteers and their parents. And, and thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for everything. And our ex-clients, um, we've also 
uh, done so much for us, um, especially one of them who really had the foresight to see that we would probably end up in a lot of trouble. Thank you. Thank you so much for all that support. Uh, Mandy and Pat, so tell us uh, where are you at at the moment now with the horses? So, um, obviously now with the COVID situation, which I, mean, I don't even want to talk about it because I'm sure everybody's so tired of hearing about it. But it's the reality. I mean, are you guys, are you comfortable with enough feed for your horses? And, and how, are we, how is it going? Well, we, we experience, we're actually in the same sort of uh, belt. We, we experience those Botswana highs. So we're a very dry area as well. So we're into a drought as well, yeah. Um, fortunately, there's not much livestock here. So uh, we don't have to compete with too much livestock. Um, so it's very dry, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, the prediction that the rains will come will, will, will help us along. As I say, it's, it's low felt, so the grass here is extremely uh, good. It's very nutritious. Um, that's all we need is the grass, which keeps us going. Um, hopefully that will come this year. If it doesn't, then we're really in, in sticky. <laughs> Andrew, is that your dog? Those are my dogs, I'll mute. <laughs> no, it's fine. I was gonna ask you before you mute yourself. Um, how's it going in, in Namibia? Tell us about, with, uh, besides, I know the wild horses and I know the south always very dry, um, but for you guys and, and on your farm, for the, your uh, horseback safaris? Yeah, we were very lucky to have good rains this year. So we've got a lot of annual grass around still. So I also just out in the bush, living the life, living the dream. So we're very <laughs> fortunate. Last year, last year, we had no grass. I'm amazed that it came back so well. It looked like a desert year last year, but it came back. We had 490 mils, so we sure. were very lucky. Yeah. That is very, very, very fortunate. fortunate. <laughs> really. Well, yeah. um, we are going to be chatting to an amazing lady next week, um, Brigitte Barch. I'm sure you've been following her story um, also on CNN. And uh, she, uh, she's, walking, she's walking to the wild horses. She did half of the journey um this year and she's doing the other half next year it's a remarkable story um so i'm very excited to meet her and i can't wait to introduce it to you guys um a hearty thank you for, for for to you tegan and to to pat and and mandy and my team uh for being here tonight and and thank you helen of course for everything um so i hope to keep the story alive contribute to tourism and um, please uh, support us on our Facebook pages, our in-link page, Events Link Africa, Namibia Horse Safari, Mozambique Horse Safaris, and of course, our beloved Wild Horses Foundation. So I want to thank everybody. Have a wonderful evening. I just want to be in time for load shedding for our Cape Tonian fans. So I uh, thank you very much, everybody. Has anyone got any questions? Any of my colleagues got a question for any of the team? Well, thanks, Michelle, from us. Thank you so yeah. much for putting all this Fantastic. together. And it's so lovely meeting you all. It really is. Thank you so much. Oh, the pleasure yeah. is all ours. <laughs> Sorry, Tegan, you were saying? It's so lovely to see everyone's faces. Haven't seen everyone for so long. Soon, I hope, let the borders <laughs> open. All right, yeah. everybody. <laughs> we can't wait to see you all in, in lovely oh. Week in Namibia, we um, hopefully the borders will open so we can welcome you and uh, wishing you all a blessed and wonderful evening. Stay safe. Thank you Thank so much. You. Thank, Thank you. Good, Good luck, night, guys. Enjoy Thank the wine. Thank you very much, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Yes.